Welcome to Poems You Need, where two poets who believe in the transformative power of language share the poems they need in hopes of helping you find the poems you need, too. Hi, I'm Kelly Russell Agadon. And I'm Melissa Stuttered. And today we're sharing poems by Jennifer Jean. And I chose a poem that is about three of my favorite topics, the Pacific Ocean, surfing, and also hope. And it has one of my most favorite titles of a poem. It's called Hope is Not Cancelled. Hope is not cancelled. Without a boogie board, you'd fling your body into the curve of the Pacific. Without baby oil, you'd still burn and be tender for days. Without a blanket, you'd drop your faded eddy shirt, sit or later shake it out and mop off the salt. Without shades, you'd razor your hand like a visor, squint at five footers rushing up at gulls. Without money, you'd drink from a fluoridated bubbler. You'd eat that deflated PB&J, box of raisins, yellow apple. Without a comb, your hair would turn to loose dreads, damp with foam, with mist. Without shoes, your hot, calloused, hobbling feet would be fleet, would crave the Pacific. Without a boombox, you'd hear other people's music. You'd walk the slanted shore till you found your music. Without somebody's love, there'd be a miracle. There'd be today. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> I agree about the title. I really love when a title brings good news. Hope is not canceled. <laughs> um, anyway, I I think it's really interesting how she disrupts the pattern in this poem. You know, she at the beginning, you get the feeling that, you know, without this, this would happen. Without this, this would happen. So like something bad would happen for all the things that are lacking. But by the time you get to the ending, it starts becoming neutral and then it becomes actually good. And that disruption of the poem is, or the pattern is like really startling. It makes you really stop and think about the things that, that she's presenting. You know, yeah, She starts a pattern. I mean, that's, I love poems that start a pattern and then, you know, break it at some point. And I, I was thinking this would actually make a really good poetry prompt like writing without 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 because you're right it is kind of that opposite tension like without a comb you, you know oh loss but then there's the beauty afterwards yes yes totally and um yeah it's just all the the vivid details and the 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 energy um you know it it propels really into the poem that I'm about to read too. They're both from the same chapbook, Vaz, and it's um, all the poems in this chapbook are related in some way to a particular song or the music of this period or a particular band, which is why we have our, I have my I'm with the band shirt and Kelly has her Woodstock shirt. We wore them in honor of you, Jennifer. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, that the energy of the particular songs just really drives the poems. Like, I feel like even, you know, my poem, for instance, mentions a Whitney Houston poem, um, I mean, a Whitney Houston song. But even if you didn't know that it was about that song, you could feel the energy of that song in the poem. So I'm going to share this one now. The Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow Tree. Beach drives with bench seats and no buckles meant four kids in back and two up front with mom and her nursing school textbooks meant mom yelling, why am I driving? We're, where are the moms? And I'd think, where are the dads? But then I never thought that. Dadlessness was a given in our building. We'd head back to our building 
So she could skip out to some swing shift, some comedy club. So my brother could collect blankets and belts and string, then lay in the hall where I'd roll him in the Afghan, belt his arms and shins, then roll him and tie him and roll him and tie him till he was a giggling prison, a squirmy cartoon worm. We called it Houdini time. And I'd shove him in the closet so he could escape in the dark. The dark made life harder, maybe. Sometimes I'd skip out as he struggled, skip up to a bench under the shady Runfelsia tree in purple bloom, in the new wing for the elderly. I'd try to read the Westing game, but couldn't concentrate, couldn't bear to be alone in the fragrant open. It was too wonderful, too awful. I'd hear ordinary robins. I'd try hard to stall and escape, sing Whitney's greatest love of all to myself, till I'd think, this is sappy crap. But then I never thought that. I believed in the song, and the song believed in me. Wow. One thing I really appreciate about both of these Jennifer poems is how Jennifer is able to put the reader into the era where the thing is taking place, um, just with these details of like no buckles in the car and boom box. Like that is a specific time. And it's really a treat when when you are completely engaged in a poem where someone doesn't have to say 19, you know, 1987, this happened. And then just mentioning these certain details brings us in. And the other thing I loved was the Houdini time. Like that just made me laugh because that's so of, of a child of childlikeness and of that era where these games were invented and then they get a name. Want to do Houdini time or we're doing Houdini time? I love that. <laughs> I really love that too. And you're so right about the details. I mean, she conveys so much, so naturally in such a small space, you know, just looking at the beginning, it's like, you know, they're at the beach, they're in a car with bench seats, no buckles, there are six kids, the mom's in nursing school. I mean, there's just so much packed in there and none of it feels like intentional exposition. She's not saying, well, mom was in nursing school back then. You just know because the textbooks are there. And such a great way of revealing information and putting you in the minute, in the mood. Um, of- right. It's it's a masterclass in, um, I always like when I, when I see a read a poem, I think about like, well, what can we learn from this as poets? And it's a masterclass and how to write a poem about childhood or a specific time with making it interesting, but also getting the reader there without those, you know, very obvious details. Like you said, you know, the, the nursing book on, on the seat. Yeah. In the car, we, we get it. We get the backstory without Jennifer having to explain all the backstory to us. Yeah. It's so well done. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, we all have our just natural preferences, obviously, and I tend towards surreal lyrics, you know, poems that are more emotion-based than narrative-based. But with a poem like this, I think, yeah, I really like narrative poetry a lot more than I thought I did, you know. Yeah, definitely. I mean, with poets like this writing poems, you know, it just, it makes narrative poetry so engaging and not, it's not telly. It's just, you're just in the moment with, with the speaker. Well, it's so alive and it makes you realize you can do the same thing with the details of your own life. Like I, I think my hesitancy towards narrative poetry sometimes is like, well, I don't want to write about myself. Nobody's interested in that, you know, but then I see like her childhood and I'm like, this is so interesting. And I played games like that too. And maybe if I wrote about them, they'd be interesting. You know? It's inspiring. I think childhood poems are, are some of the hardest to write because like, they have to be interesting to others. And so to do it, and, and one thing Jennifer does with the craft is so much music. Like I had, 
in the poem before hope has um, not been canceled, there was razor and visor, like those, those two words on top of each other. They just um, brought music in and, you know, her book is filled with music and that, you know, there were saturations was the term when she did an interview with us at two Sylvia's weekly muse, they had, she used that term saturations where you listen to a lot of music and you write. And I don't know if she invented it, but she owns it for sure. It absolutely does. And you can feel the saturation in these poems, you know, you, you also are saturated. Like, I feel like, yeah, like I just, I'm living in that song with her. Like if she was listening to it over and over while she was writing it now, that is, yeah, it is completely saturating me as well. Yeah. It's a really good thing to try. I mean, anyone listening, try a saturation and see what you get. Thank you for celebrating poetry with us today. Information about the poet and works featured can be found on the episode page. And if you enjoyed today's reading, please press the like button and subscribe so not to miss another poem. You can also share the episode with a friend, and we hope you do. Until next time, we wish you beauty, inspiration, and very meaningful days. May you always have the poems you need.